An old admonition is engraved here. Let no one ignorant of geometry or the irrational numbers enter. Thirty-seven told me you are the integers. She's the genius kissed by the god of truth. She can see our numbers and has never made a mistake. But I don't understand. Why would you break the silence at the meeting? I apologize, Miss Sophia. I won't defend our behavior. You may save that apology for later. If you can persuade more than half of the people to vote for your friend's commutation, perhaps she won't be sentenced to death. I have gathered some case files from the past. I hope it will be of some help. These files are... But won't you be in trouble for helping us? I have my own reasons. Integers are the living example of virtues, the standard of purification. It represents a soul existing in the world of forms, a true being. It is the floating points behind the decimal which dent the process of our overall purification. The evil. The ones who violate rules knowingly. The ones who turn a positive number into negatives. And a civil person, a criminal. If integers like you would lose your life over some unintentional mistakes, wouldn't it be a great shame? Besides, I can't stand the idea of you being killed in front of me. Not rigorous. For one thing, we still don't know Virgin Incinetto's numbers. For another, the fact that every crow we've seen is black doesn't necessarily entail that the next crow will also be black. Even if every virtuous person we met has been an integer, we can't be certain that the next one will still be an integer. Same case for irrational numbers. You're right, 37. But people always tend to believe that virtuous people are integers. That is what we call belief. Correct. But not entirely correct. Everyone can make mistakes. Numbers are just numbers. They are not associated with virtues. Unlike me, you're always right. 37. I don't know what differs us. Will you be at the assembly? Yes. Then I will leave them with you. I... I'm not qualified to set foot in the Hall of Truth. I have done poorly in receiving the guests. I will ask Six for my punishment after the assembly. Huh? So you... are not coming back to my laboratory? Neither will you help me review the calculation results or sort out the books? The scripture shall not be challenged. What's more, any students here can help you in the laboratory. It doesn't have to be me. Hmm. Had I known, I would have let someone else welcome Virtin and her friends. Like 210. 
He loves to brag to young ladies so much that he would take the punishment willingly, right? You were that someone else who was assigned to receive them in the first place. If I hadn't stopped you in time, how much longer would Regulus's head have stayed in your mouth? Not to mention what happened last time, and the time before that. But... The fact that I have messed up all the receptions before doesn't mean I may excel in the next one. The chances of messing up the first reception and the hundredth reception are the same. Whatever you say, you little sophist. Everyone says so. But compliments won't help her find her number. So, Fertin, are you ready for the debate? Does that mean you will help us? Of course. I don't want to miss the chance. What chance? The chance to see your numbers. There's no greater knowledge than the knowledge of oneself. And there's no more exciting truth than the truth of oneself. I can quickly tell which types of numbers you are, but it requires proof to know the exact number of your soul. I want to know the answer before you see your own numbers. So it's 37 who proves it, not 13. I'd be glad to give this chance to you. That's boring. <sighs> Let's go, Vertin. The assembly's about to start. Don't worry, Timekeeper. I'll defend myself. Back in the Foundation, I once won a public debate of a similar nature. This is my duty. I won't let it get in the way of the team's investigation. Senator. By our tradition, Miss Sonetto will be given the poisoned wine, so she will be muted and stay that way forever. However, Sophia raised her objection against the decision. After giving the matter some discreet thought, I have decided it is necessary to hold an assembly and take care of it democratically. Those of you who agree to the death sentence may remain seated. Those of you who wish to commute Miss Sonetto's punishment Please put your pebble into the pot in the middle of the hall. Now, Miss Aneto, Miss Vertin, you may defend yourselves. 
until the sand in this hourglass falls to the bottom. I am Sonetto from St. Pavla Foundation. I wish all the honorable audiences here would lend me their ears to hear my defense as a humanitarian gesture. What number are you? Defendant, the court requires an answer. What is your number? What? Me? No, I don't have a number. Don't waste our time. People without a number cannot stand in the Hall of Truth. All her words are void. Sentence her to death now! Forty-two's argument is valid. Defenders, what do you wish to contend? What? It's valid? I... Objection! According to the record, the last time we inflicted severe punishment was in 1980 to a visitor who ate beans. He ate a carbuncle that feeds on beans, and he was sentenced to death according to the said theory. In our scripture, eating beans is the most evil sin, which undoubtedly fits the most severe punishment. But if we are now executing people for breaking the silence at the assembly, how would it reflect our attitude towards the consumption of beans? Has the latter become less sinful? I suggest Neto's punishment to be commuted. A good argument. 37's argument is deemed valid. The debate will continue. Objection. The punishment for eating beans is to throw the offenders into the Gorgon current, while the punishment for the silence breaker is to drink poisoned wine. Among all the punishments we have, there's no other punishment more dreadful than being thrown into the Gorgon Current. Because eternity and infinity are the two things we have the least knowledge of, which makes them the most ghastly punishments among all. Giving her the poisoned wine doesn't make the consumption of beans less sinful. Her argument is invalid. Both of the crimes would fall into the same category if we are taking the punishment as a frame of reference, which is death. Objection. The two crimes in question are not commensurable, which makes your comparison invalid. debate I I see so that's how it works timekeeper relax I will help you
I'm here for a worn tooth. by quoting 42's first argument. People without a number cannot stand in the Hall of Truth. In that case, it's not possible for Sonetto to commit a crime in the Hall of Truth. Because she can't even be in the Hall. What? Good point, Virgin. This is our chance to out-argue them. Really clumsy sophisms. We've all seen her break the maxim. Objection! What you see cannot be submitted to the court as a transcendental fact. It's nothing but the fragments of the phenomenal world which can't be used in your argument. Objection sustained. Please, ladies and gentlemen. Keep the debate logically consistent. Since Sonato has no number, and a person without a number does not exist before the truth, Sonato thus didn't offend your truth. She didn't break any rules. has a number. We can all tell that she is very likely an integer. Therefore, she should be identified as an unknown number, not void. Your sophism has failed. 42's argument is held valid. Is there anything else you'd like to add, defendant? Uh, tell you a secret, Virgin. We would call criminals negative numbers. 
I got it. It is easy to prove Sonetto's innocence. According to the law of the excluded middle, Sonetto either committed a sin or committed no sin. The two statements cannot be both false at the same time. Since we consider a criminal as a negative number and a non-criminal as a positive number, Sonetto at present is considered an unknown number. That means she doesn't belong to the criminal set or the non-criminal set. She did not commit a sin and did not commit no sin. It's a paradox. I hereby demand to modify the criminal sentence that has been given to Sonetto. Excluded middle, a good sophism. Good for you to create a paradox from one sentence of my argument. But pitifully, you've made a fatal mistake. You've taken my argument as the basis of your defense. I said people without a number should be expelled from the Hall of Truth. You don't have a number either, Miss Outsider. Based on my argument, which has also been approved by you, I argue that all your arguments are invalid. <gasps> There's no time left. Thirteen has a number. I saw it. What? Thirty-seven, do you know what you're saying? Yeah, I read her number, just now. Thirteen's number is zero. Oh, 
professional. It could be found. Can't be mad. Uh huh. A perfect argument! Welcome to the world of numbers! Huh. Are you a rational numbers? Closer. That's right. Take a few more steps and immerse yourself in the shadow, including that hat. You don't want those good ears to hear this private conversation. That pad of paper from the miss? Yes, the one wielding the ruler? Is quite valuable. I can tell it is of a certain age, and records quite a lot of anecdotes. One visitor to the island took out a baguette from his luggage. To share it with others, he made an attempt to parcel it off. Another visitor fell to the ground and happened to sit on a quart measure and break it. You can learn the punishments for them from the paper. The former was thrown into the sea, while the latter into the further sea. <sighs> Only God knows how this wine-dark sea holds so many visitors. Bait. That's really a pain in the neck for that logical, pragmatic assistant of yours, isn't it? People always tend to mark what they can't figure out as arcanists' doings, as if things would make sense once they do so. But it won't change the fact that the debate is only a game involving sophistry, improvisation, and straw man fallacy. So what makes it superior to beans? if the form is what they are really after. Anyways, whoever fools the others first will win the game. No Arcanum at all. And that argument of hers is the best attraction for the audience. Hmm. A special number. A zero. You are neither positive nor negative, which means you don't belong to either side. Now, imagine one side as an orderly line and the other as those wandering around. The wanderers can smell the abnormality in you, and of course, no one in that line sees you as one of them. In a restaurant, fruits are served without the seeds, but in a farm, the seeds are retained for the next harvest. Is there any value in the seeds? Ah, it depends on what you see when you look at them. <sighs> the moment you realize that, you have come to the crossroad of fate. Now, back to the number we just talked about. Oh my! It's the prediction of your whole life! Can you believe that? You owe that spirited little genius a thank you. By the way, what do you see in her number? Ah, yes. 
Of course. 37 is larger than zero. But it's not so stable as zero. These prime numbers, they are just hard to divide because they have very few things in common with others. That's why she's always so energetic, highly and solely focused on what she takes an interest in. She has nothing like the characteristics of the ones you know in the Grey and White House. Those people are proud of themselves for having kind-hearted factors around them. As their teaching goes, it's always dangerous to be unique. But some look up at her again and again, exactly because they can sense the danger in her. You are also a good example. You've been looking up, haven't you? As their teaching goes, it's always dangerous to be unique. 